and welcome to Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about the people behind today's virology headlines, people just like you working to understand viruses and how they affect you. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we are talking with doctors and scientists involved in coronavirus and COVID-19 related research so that you can learn who they are and what they do. I am Larissa Thackeray, and I'm hosting this podcast from America's heartland in St. Louis, Missouri. On April 2nd, 2020, we talked with Dr. Matthew Kelly, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Duke University and in the Duke Microbiome Center, who is a pediatrician and physician scientist trained in infectious diseases, global health, and human microbial ecology. He received his MD degree from Harvard Medical School and his MPH degree from the Harvard School of Public Health before completing his pediatrics training at the Boston Combined Residency Program in Pediatrics. He was a David N. Pincus Pediatric Global Health Fellow at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, during which he worked as a hospitalist in Botswana, focusing on pediatric pneumonia. He then completed pediatric infectious disease training at Duke University with a focus on the role of the microbiome. His current research focuses on the impact of the microbiome on SARS-CoV-2 infection and bacterial respiratory infections in children. Happy to have you with us today. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you become interested in infectious disease research? Yeah, no, thank you for having me. So um, I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Duke University. Um, And in addition to caring for children who are in the hospital uh, or in clinic with rare or complicated infections, I'm mostly a researcher. Um, and really, uh, most of my work has focused on understanding how the microbiome influences the risk and severity of respiratory infections. Um, I think my path to infectious diseases specifically uh, was a little bit windy. I really went into pediatrics thinking I was going to be a pediatric oncologist. And uh, I should mention, I, I still primarily take care of children, uh, immunocompromised children, so transplant uh, recipients and and oncology recipients only from an infectious disease standpoint. Um, And and really what I found was uh, when I was uh, in residency working on um, that, uh, working in pediatric oncology, what I was really drawn were, were to the infections that those children were developing. And so I I sort of took a turn during residency and uh, decided to uh, apply for infectious diseases fellowship. Um, And uh, in addition, did a global health fellowship in Botswana uh, that was obviously heavily uh, focused on infectious diseases. Um, So a bit of an unexpected path, but, um, you know, really a reflection of, of, uh, you know, what, what was drawing me to oncology from the first in the first place. Um, and, and looking even further back, what got you into medicine in the first place? So if you kind of think about, you know, undergrad, you know, getting into um, uh, medical school, what kind of drew you to sort of the science medicine aspect? Yeah, I, I think I, you know, I was always fascinated by biology and in particular animals. And I think if you would have asked my parents when I was a child, they would have said I was going to be a biologist or a veterinarian. Um, And I really have to credit my mom. Uh, She worked as a lab tech in uh, a hospital where a small hospital where we lived in Wisconsin. And uh, when we were younger, she used to always bring us to the hospital. And so uh, we sort of got very comfortable. My brothers and I got very comfortable in that hospital environment. And then as I got a little older, I, I started shadowing uh, physicians, um, and in particular shadowed uh, a friend's father who was a cardiologist um, and was really just amazed by uh, how much he knew about the heart and, and you know, really what he could do for his patients. And so uh, it was probably not until high school when I really decided I was going to focus on humans and not animals. Uh, but I think from the start, uh, I knew I was I was most fascinated by biology in general. Cool, cool. Um, and so, yeah, let's get right into it. So, can you tell us a little bit about how you started working on, I guess, COVID nineteen related research, and what what is the research that you've been doing? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, I like everybody else early on in the pandemic as, as things were beginning to shut down and I think it was becoming clear that this was going to have a really significant impact on our country and the world. Um, I wanted to do whatever I could to use my training in infectious diseases to sort of learn what we could about the virus and uh, really in, in you know, some way contribute to helping, I guess, the global community uh, end this pan pandemic. And um, I also was really fascinated by the fact of being somebody who studies respiratory infections in children. I was really fascinated by the fact that um, children with SARS-CoV-2 did not seem to be getting sick as frequently and certainly did not seem to be getting sick as severely as young adults and, and even adolescents. And, you know, as you know, that's, that's quite unusual for respiratory viruses. And so it suggested to me that there was something different about this virus or how it interacts with um, us as humans. Um, and that there might be some biological or immunological explanation for that. Um, and that if we could just solve that puzzle, uh, we might really be able to identify novel ways to prevent or, or treat the virus uh, in both children and adults. And so um, uh, Dr. Jillian Hurst, uh, a colleague of mine in infectious diseases at Duke, uh, we started talking early in those days and decided that um, you know, we really wanted to start studying uh, children who had the virus or were at high risk of getting the virus. And, and we started uh, the Brave Kids study, uh, which uh, since last April has been collecting uh, clinical data and biospecimens from uh, children, adolescents, and young adults who uh, are SARS-CoV-2 infected or who have a close contact, typically somebody in the home uh, like a parent or a sibling or a relative uh, who has confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. I guess to follow up on that, so what have you done with those biospecimens? What has that allowed you and others to do? Yeah, so um, to this point, uh, we, uh, we focused with the biospecimens, we focused on uh, two things. Um, the first, uh, I think, is uh, what you reached out to us about, which is uh, really some of the microbiome work that we've done. So. Um, you know, most of my work over the last several years has been focused on the respiratory microbiome. And so, uh, and, and over the past decade or so, uh, there has been increasing data from other respiratory viruses, flu, RSV, that your respiratory microbiome could influence your susceptibility to uh, those viruses, or even if you do get infected, how severely infected you get. Um, and uh, you know, I was really interested uh, in uh, whether uh, this, the same situation could be uh, the case for SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, to this point, um, we, uh, we did 16S sequencing on uh, the first 350 or so, uh, children, adolescents, and young adults um, who uh, were enrolled in that study. And we really uh, approached that analysis uh, with two questions. So one is, could we identify microbiome features, respiratory microbiome features that uh, differed in children who uh, we identified as being infected with SARS-CoV-2 compared to uh, children who were in households that put them at high risk of being exposed to SARS-CoV-2, uh, but who did not become infected. And then the second question we asked was, uh, if we just focus on children, adolescents, and young adults who have acquired the virus, do we see any microbiome features that are associated with whether or not they uh, develop respiratory symptoms, symptomatic illness? Um, and so uh, in looking at that, we identified specific bacteria that do seem to be, uh, do, do seem to differ in children who do or do not have SARS-CoV-2. Um, so in particular, um, a bacteria, uh, bacterial genus referred to as Carinobacterium, which is a common uh, genus in the upper respiratory tract, uh, was more abundant in uh, individuals who had SARS-CoV-2 um, and uh, also was 
uh, more abundant in children and adolescents and young adults who had respiratory symptoms. Uh, and then we, I think more interestingly, um, found that a, another bacteria, a bacteria called Delosigranulum pygrum, um, is more abundant uh, in the absence of respiratory symptoms. So potentially having a beneficial effect. And I think that bacteria is quite interesting because it's been shown to be a health promoting bacteria um, in general in the respiratory tract. It very rarely causes human disease. Um, and so uh, it sort of is in keeping with how we, we have generally thought of that bacteria. And then I think perhaps the most interesting piece of all of this is that uh, if you look at how the respiratory microbiome changes with age uh, from birth until uh, young adulthood, um, the changes that we see in age uh, and specifically the changes that we see in the abundances of those bacteria that are associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection or uh, respiratory symptoms, um, it really suggests that uh, these age-related changes in the respiratory microbiome uh, could be contributing to some of the differences in illness severity and illness susceptibility that we see between children and adults. Um, and so that really sort of uh, tied that whole story together for us. And I, I think, um, you know, there are obviously limitations to that analysis, uh, but the idea would be that your respiratory microbiome is talking to your immune system um, and uh, through those interactions uh, could in some way be uh, influencing uh, how likely you are to develop COVID or how severe COVID is if you do get infected. Right, right. And I guess just to take a step back, so compared to say, um, you know, other you know, people listening might be more aware of sort of like the gut microbiome, what is the respiratory microbiome like? Like what is its sort of typical features in a way? How diverse is it? How much do you have of it? Because I think that it's not one necessarily that you think so much of being teeming with bacteria, maybe viruses, but not so much bacteria and things like that. So what is it like? Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, important to, to talk about first. Um, and, and really it's an incredibly um, simple microbiome if you compare it to the gut microbiome. Um, so in most of the um, studies where we've looked at the respiratory microbiome, there are about five or six bacterial genera that comprise more than 90% of the respiratory microbiome, uh, really across age and across uh, you know, the spectrum of disease. Um, it, in an individual, it tends to be an incredibly low diversity microbiome. So uh, we see, particularly in infants and young children, that an individual infant uh, their microbiome uh, may be uh, uh, dominated by or mostly composed of a single bacterial species or, or uh, taxon, um, you know, 70 or 80% uh, abundance and really making up the majority of that respiratory microbiome. Uh, whereas, you know, you typically don't see those degree of, of uh, disruptions of uh, a gut microbiome, and obviously there's a lot more uh, species that are tending to be found in a, a typical gut microbiome. Um, as far as the actual uh, species that you might see or the genera that you might see, um, uh, we see a lot of staph, um, we see a lot of strep, um, we see uh, haemophilus, which uh, you know is a, a common respiratory uh, contains a, a common respiratory pathogen, that genus, um, Moraxella, um, and then the two sort of beneficial groups of bacteria that we think about in the respiratory microbiome are Carinobacterium and, and Delosigranulum. So those five or six um, genera of bacteria uh, tend to comprise the majority of, of the respiratory microbiome. And the ones that you've identified in, in the work with SARS, are these uh, bacteria that can be cultured? Yeah, they, they are. So focusing on both Carinobacterium and Delosigranulum. So Delosigranulum is the one you were referring to that uh, tends to be protective. Um, you can culture that out. Um, we've done that in, in our lab and um, you can study it. And, and there are people, you know, it's, it's 
uh, sort of a small group of individuals who are interested in those bacteria, but that's been a major focus of our work again, because um, they seem to have these in general beneficial effects to respiratory health. So from these findings, um, sort of what is the next step? I mean, is the idea that you would give people this bacteria or do you need to understand sort of the immune pathways that they're triggering in order to drug, as it were, those pathways? What are sort of the next steps? Yeah, I, I think there are a few steps that probably need to be happening in parallel. Um, I think my vision for this work and for respiratory microbiome research in general is that we move towards a place where uh, just like we have probiotics for the gut, um, we have probiotics or other microbiome-based therapeutics that we can deliver into the upper respiratory tract uh, for the purpose of preventing or treating uh, respiratory infections. And there are already some data from animal models that that can be an effective way of, of accomplishing both of those goals. And so I think, you know, one step is uh, we really don't have a, um, a precedent for that, right? There aren't probiotics that are approved uh, for upper respiratory delivery. And so we really need to develop ways to uh, give those organisms safely into the upper respiratory tract and really study that in humans. And so I think that's one area in which we need um, more information. Um, the second area is exactly what you suggested, which is um, for the most part, we think when we see these microbiome associations with um, respiratory infection susceptibility and severity, we think that's because these bacteria are interacting with the immune system and uh, the immune system is mediating their effect essentially. Um, but we really don't have those mechanisms worked out in the vast majority of cases. And so I, I think working out those mechanisms um, could really be incredibly helpful, you know, one, in identifying patients who are most likely to benefit from any sort of microbiome therapeutic. Uh, but two, in doing so, you could also identify uh, protective uh, immune factors that could also be explored as potential um, you know, novel therapeutics or, or uh, targets for uh, novel preventative approaches. So is this stuff that you have to do in patient cohorts, or do you actually start moving into some sort of small animal model to actually look at this? Yeah, I, I mean, as you know, the sort of clinical cohorts we're studying are incredibly complex. And so I think you can see associations and signals, and you can certainly generate hypotheses. One of the, the ways that we're looking at that is, you know, we're very interested in integrating microbiome data with data on the local host immu immune response. And that can be done by looking at respiratory cytokines, or you can do things like RNA sequencing and, and really look at gene expression profiles and and see if you can identify um, associations between uh, specific microbes in the upper respiratory tract and uh, what genes are being expressed by the host in the upper respiratory tract. Um, so that's one way that you can do it um, in the context of, of these studies. And I think that can give you a lot of insight, but uh, I do think at, at some point um, to really uh, work out the um, precise mechanisms, the biological mechanisms that are underpinning that. Um, in a lot of cases, you need to go back to the lab and, and you know, identify a relevant animal model in which you could really, um, you know, in a more controlled setting, um, administer these bacteria into the upper respiratory tract and see what effect they're having on the immune system and on, uh, you know, susceptibility and severity of, of respiratory virus infections. Are you thinking about sort of translating some of this to other viral infections? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you can understand how uh, the respiratory microbiome is interacting with the host immune response, uh, the host immune system and really influencing your response to potential pathogens, absolutely. I think there's, um, 
you know, there's likelihood that those findings could extend to, to other respiratory viruses or potentially other pathogens, you know, bacterial infections that we see in, in children and adults. Um, and, and I also think if, you know, if we take SARS-CoV-2 as an example, if we're able to understand how the respiratory microbiome interacts with uh, the host immune system to influence SARS-CoV-2, uh, even if we focus primarily on children and adults to work out those uh, associations and those me mechanisms, uh, obviously uh, any sort of modification of the respiratory microbiome to shift the immune system in a beneficial way could also be a benefit to adults and other populations that have been more affected um, by COVID-19, more directly affected. And then to circle back, I think right at the beginning, you were saying that you were going to be using these samples, these uh, cohort samples for another study. What was that study? Yeah. So the other thing we're really interested in is, um, you know, with children and adolescents um, not uh, getting as sick uh, with SARS-CoV-2 as adults, I think one of the major questions has been, are they generating effective and durable immune responses to the virus? And so um, we've started working uh, with some of our colleagues here at Duke University to uh, look at antibody responses in um, children and adolescents uh, with SARS-CoV-2 and are following a group of a little over 100 children and adolescents over the course of a year um, and seeing them at regular intervals um, and in particular collecting serum so that we can look at those antibody responses. Um, and so we haven't yet uh, finished all of the analyses of uh, those data, um, but uh, I can tell you what we're seeing, at, at least in the initial data, is that it looks very reassuring. It looks like um, children and adolescents, uh, regardless of their initial illness characteristics, so even if they are asymptomatic, it looks like they generate antibody responses that are as robust and as durable as what we're seeing uh, in a similar group of adults that we're studying here at Duke. Oh, cool. I mean, maybe not surprising. I guess there's some data that came out, what, in the last day or so about children and the vaccination and how they responded, it seems like, very, very well with antibody responses. Um, so that, that is very cool. Yep, that's right. The adolescents and, and their response to Pfizer vaccine uh, was, if anything, you know, as, as as good or even better than adults. And I think in our data, um, we see that uh, uh, perhaps even younger children, you know, children five years of age and younger, um, that immune response may be even more robust uh, than those older groups. So let's just do a couple of questions talking more about you and your career. Um, I guess, um, thinking about sort of what you've done in, your, in the past, what's been the most exciting moment in your career so far? Yeah, I think um, looking back on this, um, I think probably the most exciting moment was um, actually when I received my first grant. So it was just a small grant from uh, the Thresher Research Fund when I was in Botswana doing a global health fellowship. But um, I just thought it was the coolest and you know coolest thing that somebody was going to pay me money to study a problem that. Um, you know, I had thought was fascinating and important. Um, and, you know, I obviously, uh, to get where I am, I've had to get more grants after that. But I think just that first one, you know, really making me feel like I could do this and, you know, just being excited about being given the chance to study a problem uh, really stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, conversely, what's been the most difficult thing you've had to overcome? And I guess, how did you overcome it? Yeah, I, I think I, I took a little bit of an unusual path in research. Certainly, um, you know, I'm an MD uh, researcher as opposed to an MD PhD. Um, and I think, you know, there's a typical model of, uh, particularly with lab research of, um, you know, getting your start in the lab of an established investigator or as part of a larger funded project. And I think from the start um, in my Global Health Fellowship, really the emphasis was on developing your own idea and your own project and funding that 
Um, and, you know, uh, I, I was able to do that with, with of course, a, a ton of support uh, from mentors. But I think really looking back on that approach, it probably had a pretty high likelihood of failure. Um, and, you know, I think it required a huge amount of work and perseverance and a lot of support from, you know, a great number of mentors to be successful. Uh, but I think it's something I've had to, to overcome is, you know, name rec recognition is incredibly important in academics. Um, and it takes a while to establish yourself, uh, particularly when you're trying to carve out a line of research that is completely distinct from your mentors um, and, you know, work that isn't uh, being directly tied to somebody who's a little bit more established than you. Right. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, fellowship you did in Botswana? So, I mean, I personally actually was in the Peace Corps uh, right after college. And oh, yeah. that was one of the reasons I actually got into, I think, microbiology and what have you, because it was, it sort of showed me a whole different world of infectious diseases. And so I'm kind of curious, what was that experience like for you? And how did it sort of uh, change the way you saw healthcare in the world, but also healthcare here in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I think it was unlike any other experience I've had. Um, I had done a number of rotations in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa as a medical student um, or during, during or shortly after residency, um, but uh, I had never really had the chance to stay in a country and really learn the practice of medicine in that country and understand uh, you know, from the standpoint of a researcher, what are really the, the largest problems for um, children and adolescents in that country. Um, and uh, this fellowship was actually structured um, a lot like a typical academic fellowship. So um, I spent about half of my time working as a hospitalist uh, at the main hospital in uh, the country's capital, um, Haberone. And so uh, I worked with the medical students and residents to um, take care of, uh, you know, children, primarily children with infections um, who uh, were admitted to, to the uh, busy ward in that hospital. Um, and then I had about 50% of my time protected to really start a research program um, and to develop the skills that are necessary to, um, one, conduct clinical research, but then too, also to do it in a way, uh, you know, that is culturally sensitive and, and, uh, you know, also is able to overcome uh, challenges to doing research in an international setting. Um, and so I, I think uh, what I learned from that fellowship, uh, as opposed to the primarily clinical um, rotations that I had done in sub-Saharan Africa is really that, um, you know, that the clinical work is incredibly important uh, and we need uh, people who are doing that and who are helping to train um, areas, uh, uh, physicians in areas with less resources to, um, you know, to ensure that um, we are ideally developing uh, a sustainable model for clinical care in those settings. Uh, but I think what I realized is, is one way that I could make my mark and uh, potentially have a larger uh, benefit and a longer term benefit was really through research um, and really trying to um, understand how we're taking care of kids with infections in Botswana and understand how we can learn from uh, Botswana as an example and potentially um, use that information to improve infections for uh, kids across Africa or even in, in other settings. And so are there aspects of that now in your research today? Do you still do have collaborations with um, uh, groups in Africa? I do. Actually, most of my respiratory microbiome work has still been focused in Botswana. Um, and uh, it, it's shifted uh, really to focusing on um, infants and looking at how the respiratory microbiome influences their risk of pneumonia. Um, pneumonia, as I learned when I was in Botswana, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people in the U.S. may not realize this, but it's uh, the leading killer of children across the 
the world, and that's certainly the case in Botswana as well. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, certainly among the most significant problems that we dealt with on the ward. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's a disease that actually, uh, for the most part, is is uh, entirely preventable or mostly uh, uh, primarily preventable um, and really is closely linked to poverty. Um, and that's the situation in other parts of the world. And it's also the situation here in the U.S. And so, you know, really wanting to focus on uh, disease that affects some of our most vulnerable uh, groups of kids here in the U.S., uh, but also in other countries. Cool, cool. Um, so as we're wrapping up, um, just a couple of questions about how you have been coping in this past year with the pandemic. Obviously, it's affected everyone in different ways. How have you been coping? And then I guess, you know, sort of as a doctor and as a researcher, you have sort of a different or more unique view on sort of safety, vaccination and things like that. So how have you sort of dealt with that yourself, but also sort of talking to family, friends, coworkers, things like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been obviously challenging for all of us. And, um, you know, it's really obviously changed what my day-to-day -day looks like and how everybody, what everybody's day-to-day -day looks like. But I think in general, it's, it, it, I've taken a few things from it. And I think, you know, one thing is, I think I'm actually, um, you know, it's reminded me to not sweat the little things. I think in academics, it's, it's really easy to get caught up in small details or problems. And, you know, in the big scheme of things, uh, you know, when you look back on those things, you realize they're probably not as important as they seemed at that moment. And I think, um, you know, uh, just what we've experienced over the past year, and especially um, through my work interacting with these families that have just been profoundly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's really helped me to gain some perspective and uh, really, you know, recognize more clearly what I have to be thankful for. Um, to your sort of second question and, and, you know, what my views on the pandemic are and, and how I have generally had these discussions uh, with family. Um, you know, I think uh, I've tried to sort of model good behavior as, as far as social distancing and masking and um, really have, uh, you know, I think gotten a reputation in my family for sort of being the one that is saying, no, you can't go visit your grandkids uh, until you're vaccinated. And this is how long you need to wait until afterwards. But um, you know, it's been it's been a challenge, and I think we've had to balance the very real health risks of COVID nineteen with the very real, you know, emotional uh, and mental health uh, issues that uh, you know some of uh, the approaches that we've had to take to mitigate the pandemic um, have had on uh, on all of us. And so, uh, you know, my fiance my fiance and I spend a lot of time outside. We will go on walks, we uh, take a lot of hikes with our two dogs, um, helps us to get out of the house when we're, you know, working from home and, and you know, also helps to keep the dogs happy. Um, we've, you know, spent a lot of time gardening and doing things outside to just try to, um, you know, maintain some sense of, of normalcy. Uh, but obviously it's been hard, you know, not seeing uh, our friends and, and our family. Um, we were fortunate to see my parents uh, a few times now. They, they've now been vaccinated over the past year, but we still haven't actually seen her parents since the, the pandemic began. Um, and so that's something that we're really looking forward to. Um, and I think, um, you know, I guess my general view on the pandemic, um, you know, I, I think uh, obviously when you look at where we are compared to we, where we were a few months ago, um, you have to feel pretty good about things, right? We're giving close to 3 million vaccine doses every day. Our daily number of cases is a fraction of what it was in January. Um, and I think to this point, the data that we received uh, with regard to vaccines and the durability of the immune responses that they're generating and 
uh, how well they protect from uh, some of the most worrying variants has been really reassuring. And so I think there's a, a lot of reason to be optimis optimistic at this point. Um, but on the other hand, we are also seeing um, the UK and other more infectious variants are predictably becoming more and more common in the US. And we're already starting to see, you know, instances where uh, those variants are likely driving up case numbers. You know, this week, certainly it seems like uh, some of what we're seeing in Michigan is, is likely related to um, the UK variant. And so I, I sort of feel like we're in a race to reach herd immunity and it's unclear when we're, uh, when exactly we're going to be able to attain that. Um, you know, unfortunately these more infectious variants really seem to be moving the finish line a little bit uh, further down the road. Uh, but, you know, again, overall optimism as far as where we are and, and really what this next year will hold. Um, Long-term, I think it's clear, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is, is going to remain endemic in human populations. And I suspect we're moving towards a time when it's routine for you to get both your seasonal flu and, and you know, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine on on an annual or, or some other regular basis. So, you know, I, I do think it's going to be something that uh, will be folded into regular care that we, we do on a, a regular basis. And obviously as we get our, our case numbers further, uh, further down, um, you know, life will, will continue to move closer to, uh, to normal. Um, actually, one question I had is, do you, do you see that, our experience with SARS-2 um, actually has any implications for some of the other respiratory viruses that we were sort of accepting as normal before. So I guess what I'm talking about is like the astonishingly lack of, for example, flu that we've had. So clearly our behavior over the last year just basically vanquished flu in our communities. So do you think sort of as someone who studies this that some of that may be incorporated into sort of future actions or future behaviors to actually try and deal with some of the other respiratory viruses, especially in the pediatric population. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, to your point, it's been remarkable how little um, RSV flu, even, even at least locally here, um, how little rhinoviruses, sort of common cold viruses we've seen um, in our area, um, and really just a, a testament to the fact that, you know, how effective social distancing and masking um, is for prevention of those viruses as well. I actually was asked um, a few weeks ago by one of our chief residents to find somebody to talk to our pediatric interns about RSV bronchiolitis, which is, you know, literally, uh, when I think back to my internship, um, I remember taking care of probably hundreds of children with RSV bronchiolitis, and we have interns currently who have not seen a case of, of RSV and are going to go through this entire season without having seen a case. So I think that the one thing I've really taken away from it uh, is, you know, yes, I, I think to some extent we need to take what we've learned from this pandemic and, and how social distancing and masking has had a significant effect on these viruses that do still have a large burden in pediatrics. And we need to, um, you know, in some way uh, implement those strategies to reduce the high burden of respiratory viruses that we see during the winter season uh, amongst children, you know, whether that's um, changing behaviors and when, you know, maybe it's uh, when individuals are feeling sick, sort of, you know, just a, a, it being more accepted that you do not come to work. You, uh, you know, you uh, do not send your, your uh, children to school, you know, really trying to prevent spread of those um, viruses uh, in those environments and, you know, wearing masks in certain situations more so than we do currently. So I do think there's a lot when you think about the mitigation measures. And then I also think the other major area that I think a lot about are, are vaccines. So, you know, it has been remarkable how from first identification of this virus to, um, you know, development of an infective vaccine, 
uh, you know, in less than a year, um, you know, there have been, uh, you know, certainly there are, there are challenges to developing vaccines for specific viruses that are somewhat unique to those viruses. And, you know, there are reasons that we have struggled to develop a universal flu vaccine and why we have struggled to develop an effective RSV vaccine. Uh, but I think just, uh, you know, really the investment of the global community in developing an effective vaccine for this one respiratory virus really shows that, you know, we have strategies that, you know, you know through which we could develop effective vaccines for these other viruses that haven't received as much attention. And I think as things hopefully continue to get under control and, and you know, we really move into a situation where SARS-CoV-2 is endemic at a low level in human population, you know, I think it'll be really important for us to turn back to those viruses and think about how we can uh, motivate and really develop momentum to develop effective vaccines for them. Right, right. All right. Thanks, Matt. That was, that was awesome. Nice talking to you. Matt's research using the BRAVE cohort suggests that the respiratory microbiome may protect young kids from SARS-CoV-2, and that despite this protection, kids still mount a durable immune response against the virus. This has been Let's Meet the Virologists, a podcast about people who study viruses. This is your host, Larissa Thackeray, and thanks for listening. You can find us on Google, Apple, Amazon Music, Spotify, and other podcasts or at lmtv.podbean.com.